All right, so we're going to be looking then at the lecture notes. This is what I've titled Controversies and Councils, starting on page 190. And uh, this lecture will review a little bit of the Council of Nicaea, and then it will move on from the Council of Nicaea to look at the other, what are called ecumenical church councils. In church history, we define an ecumenical church council or a worldwide church council as a council in which both Eastern Christians, uh, Eastern Roman Christians, the Eastern half of the Roman Empire, and Western Roman Christians were involved. So when we think of an ecumenical council, we're talking about a council that involved Christian leaders from both the Eastern and Western halves of the Roman Empire. The first three of these councils, the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Constantinople, the Council of Ephesus, also involved leaders from outside of the Roman Empire, particularly in the Assyrian Church or the Church of the Far East, where there were Christians in the Sassanid and Parthian Empire, the kind of um, descendant of the Persian Empire, what would be modern-day Iran and Iraq to the east, and then some other places around the known world at the time, Christian leaders were involved in those councils. But when we talk about just Roman Christianity, there are seven of these councils where these are the major councils that involved Christian leaders from within the Roman Empire, both eastern and western halves, and there are seven that we identify as the major councils. So when we talk about the seven ecumenical councils, these are the seven councils that we are discussing. And it starts with the Council of Nicaea in 325, and then the Council of Constantinople in 381, and then Ephesus in 431, and Chalcedon in 451, and then we get the second Council of Constantinople in the 6th century, the third Council of Constantinople in the uh, 7th century, 6th century, 7th century, and then finally the Second Council of Nicaea in the 8th century. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what all of those councils stood for. Now we've made a point in this class repeatedly that we believe what we believe not because of a church council or a church creed, but because it is found in taught in the scriptures. So the scriptures are our authority over church councils. And that's going to become an important principle as we talk about these councils. Because evangelical Christians in the, um, yeah, evangelical Protestant Christians generally view the first, I would say the first four of these councils as being accurate expressions of biblical truth, maybe the first six, since the fifth and sixth councils essentially reiterated the fourth council, the Council of Chalcedon. But in any case, uh, we don't feel bound to submit to the findings of these councils, especially if those findings contradict the clear teaching of the Word of God. And that will be particularly true with the seventh of these seven ecumenical councils. And I think it'll become clear what I mean when we get to the second council of Nicaea, which took place in 787. Okay, but the principle that we establish is that the word of God is our authority, not a church council. However, insofar as a church council accurately reflects biblical truth, we do embrace and appreciate the church council. So when we look at the council of Nicaea, we don't say, oh, it's a church council. We don't have to listen to that. We ask the question, does the finding of this church council match biblical truth? Yes, it does. So the council is something that we appreciate and affirm. Okay, so we're not disregarding councils as unimportant as some people do, and we're not embracing them as authoritative as Catholics and Greek Orthodox do. Instead, we're trying to strike a biblical balance where we see Scripture as our final authority. Now, some of you are probably here at Grace Community Church on Sunday morning when Pastor MacArthur uh, talked about the fact, and he actually used a little bit of church history, and um, talked about the fact that throughout the history of the church, the person and work of Christ has been and is the most important feature of Christianity. 
and certainly we would all affirm that, that the person of Christ and then the work of Christ on the cross and in his resurrection, that those are the central tenets of Christianity. And if you lose focus of the truth about who Christ is or the truth about what Christ did, you stray from the central tenets of the gospel itself. So Christ is at the center of an orthodox, true understanding of the gospel and of Christianity itself. And so it makes sense, or it's understandable, I think, that the major controversies that arise in the early history of the church all surround the nature of Jesus Christ, his person and his work. And so sometimes people wonder, why are Christological controversies the first major controversies in church history? It's because Satan is attacking the very central core of what Christianity is. And we've already seen that in the pre-Nicene, anti-Nicene period of time. That from the very start, people were questioning the humanity of Jesus Christ. And so the docetic view of Christ, that he was only a, an appearance or a mirage, that he was not a true human being, was embraced by the Gnostics. And you had very early on Christian leaders defending the full humanity of Jesus Christ. And then when we get to Arianism, suddenly it's the deity of Jesus Christ that comes under attack. And Christian leaders are then defending the full deity of Jesus Christ. Well, those two aspects of who Jesus is, his dual nature, that he is both 100% God and 100% man, those two truths of the incarnation, those are going to become the primary points of controversy in the first six of these seven ecumenical councils. And the sixth of these takes place in the seventh century. So from the third century to the seventh century, for that 500 years of time, we are going to have church leaders discussing, debating, and uh, even anathematizing and excommunicating over the nature of the humanity and deity of Jesus Christ. If you understand that that's the core issue behind all of these major councils, with the exception of the seventh, which we'll talk about later, but if you understand that that's the core issue, it really helps to begin to simplify and solidify your understanding of all of these councils. Because admittedly, there's a lot of councils, and they can start to kind of jumble. So think, again, big picture here, what is at stake at stake is really the doctrine of the incarnation. That he who is fully God and who is co-eternal with the Father took on human flesh and became fully man so that as man he might die for men and as God he might reconcile sinful men to holy God. That is the doctrine of the incarnation. And uh, that controversies over the Incarnation raged within the earliest parts of church history for many, many centuries. All right, so let's talk a little bit about these different councils. We've already discussed the Council of Nicaea, and you've been reading about the Council of Nicaea and about some of those Christological controversies in Stephen Nichols' book, for us and for our salvation. But the issue really here is the deity of Christ. And maybe it'd be helpful for me to write some of these things down on the board just so we can keep them straight. But if we talk about the fact that we understand that Jesus Christ is, uh, let's see, how should I write this? going to scoot this over just a little bit. Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. When we look at some of these ancient heresies, we have Ebionism, 
which denied that Jesus was fully God, but affirmed his humanity. Then we have docetism, which denied that he was fully man, and actually also warped the idea of his deity, especially when we combine it with Gnosticism. We have Arianism, which denied that he was fully God and said that he was a created being. Now, Arius actually said that he was somehow exalted above humanity, but that he was not fully God. So it's this kind of idea that he's divine, but he's not fully equal to God the Father. There's going to be a few more heresies that we'll put on the board here, but it's interesting that these early heresies, almost all of them, deal with the issue of the dual nature of Jesus Christ, that he is 100% God and 100% man. The Council of Nicaea then convened in 325, the year after Constantine gained full control over the entire United Roman Empire. And uh, the three positions, just to remind you, dealing with the essence of Jesus Christ, the essence of the Son of God. In his personhood, in his essence, in his ontological makeup, who he is, his character, essence, and being, is the Son of God co-equal, co-eternal, and co-substantial with God the Father. Arius said no. Arius said that he was a created being who was of a different substance, who there was, um, in Arius' words, there was a time when he was not. And that was, of course, opposed by Athanasius. And so you have heterousius. There should be an, an E in here, not hetero. Heterousius of a different substance, was Arius's initial view. Homoousius, this third view with the iota affixed, was the view that the Arians eventually landed on because it was a little bit softer, a similar substance. But of course, similar doesn't mean same. Similar is just, just a softer way of saying different. So if you say something is similar, what you're actually saying is it's different. Just maybe not as different as... Uh, perhaps Arius would have initially wanted to explain it, but the homoousius view eventually becomes the Arian view because they could fit their view into it. Initially a compromise view. But homoousius is the view that triumphs at the Council of Nicaea, and it does so because those church leaders understood that that was what had always been taught about the nature of Christ, and they were articulating and affirming that biblical truth, that the Son of God is indeed equal with God the Father. And so you have, then, at the Council of Nicaea, you have the full deity of Jesus Christ affirmed, that he is fully God. Now, the Arian and Trinitarian controversy is going to continue to rage in the Roman Empire for several decades. It's going to be about 50 years or so while this controversy goes on and the Athanasius is getting continually kicked out of his church and going out into the Egyptian wilderness and having to hang out with Anthony the Hermit and some of the other Egyptian monastics, early monastics because he spends 17 years outside of his pulpit in exile because Arianism is trying to gain political control back and forth. The Cappadocian fathers are up in Asia Minor. They're also defending the truth of Trinitarianism to uh, the full deity and personhood of the Son. They add also... Uh, an emphasis on the full deity and personhood of the Holy Spirit. And in 381, we have another council. And this council, the Council of Constantinople, is called by Theodosius the Great, or Theodosius I. And it finally puts an end 
to the Aryan controversy. There's a new issue, number three here you can see, a new issue called Apollinarianism. Apollinarianism Did I spell that right? No. It's one P and two L's. Apollinarianism actually denies both the full deity of Christ and the full humanity of Christ. Apollinarius essentially taught that... Um, Well, it, it primarily denies his full humanity, but Apollinarius essentially taught that the spirit part of God uh, took over essentially a human body so that it wasn't, um, let me say it this way, uh, we understand that human beings consist of both a material part and an immaterial part. And throughout history, there's been debate about whether or not we should see that as a, a bifold division or a trifold division, whether it's body, soul, and spirit, or just the material part, the body, and the immaterial part, the soul, spirit. But in either case, Apollinarius denied that Christ possessed the immaterial part of what makes a human being a human being. And so it was simply the shell of a body that was essentially possessed by... Uh, the second member of the Trinity is what Apollinarius taught. To use an illustration, and I've heard this illustration used before, it's as though uh, you're slipping a letter into an envelope. So the immaterial part of what makes a human being a human being, Christ did not possess. It was simply that, the, that God was kind of inserted into the shell of a human body. That was Apollinarius' view. So, Apollinarius opposed Arius, and he did affirm the full deity of Christ, so I'll take that off. But, he injected a new problem, teaching that Christ had deity, but in humanity, Christ had only a body and no soul spirit. So, the immaterial part of what makes a man or human being a human being Christ did not possess that immaterial part. That was Apollinarius' view. Thus, Christ lacked a human nature. He only had a human body. So it's a denial of the dual nature of who Christ is. Fully God and fully man. Apollinarius would say, yes, he was fully God, but he was only partially man in the sense that he only had a human body. Yep, Tucson. The created being on the fully man. Um, that is not sound so correct. But uh, <laughs> it's always a good way to start a question. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm trying to understand the the word being made flesh coming into existence and just trying to wrap my head around created being being something. Are we saying that's a negative thing? For him to say that the fully man was, the, the created being under fully man is a, is a negative thing? For Arianism? Yeah, I was just trying to make the, yeah, I'm, I'm not applauding or affirming any part of Arianism, just to be clear. Um, I'm just making the point that Arius taught that Essentially, the Son was lower than God the Father, but higher than anything else in creation. So he taught that he was a created being. So Arius didn't necessarily deny the humanity of Christ. So maybe I'll erase that just to help keep our chart clear. But he didn't deny the humanity of Christ in the Incarnation, but he did deny clearly the full deity of the Son of God. So this... This dual nature concept that in the incarnation, the second member of the Trinity took on flesh and became fully man. He who was from eternity past fully God became in the incarnation fully man. And you have now 
uh, this supernatural miracle in which the one person, Jesus Christ, is simultaneously 100% God and 100% man. That's something that it took people a little while. I mean, we see that in the scriptures, but for people to be able to think through that and formulate that and articulate that, this is something that in church history takes a long time for people to kind of wrap their heads around and fully submit to in the sense of their attempt to articulate it clearly. Uh, Because it's something that we understand is a mystery. It's a mystery, a supernatural, miraculous mystery, in the sense that we can't fully understand it. But we're at a time in history where people are trying to understand things, and they often end up going into heresy when they allow logic to trump biblical revelation. It's not coincidental that uh, the heresy seem to bounce from one extreme back to the other, uh, from fully man to fully God. Yeah, there is that pendulum swing effect. So we have the, you know, we have the Ebionites who are denying his deity, and then we have the Gnostics who are denying his humanity, and then Arius is denying his deity, and then Apollinarius, in response to Arius is trying to figure out a different logical way to explain this, and he wants to affirm the deity, so he's going to compromise the humanity. And ultimately, Scripture says both are true, and ultimately in church history, people are going to come to recognize that both are true, and they're going to establish the fact that it is a mystery, and we need to stop trying to explain it. Was Apollinarius a modalist? Uh, No, I don't think he was a modalist, Um, not to my knowledge anyway. So I I believe he affirmed the Trinitarian understanding of the Council of Nicaea with regard to the distinctiveness of the three persons of the Trinity. What he was denying was the full humanity of Jesus Christ. So um, he's denying essentially that there's, you know, we talk about as human beings, we have and, and I'm going um, I, to, I recognize this all as part of the immaterial part of who we are, but we recognize that we have a, a, a spirit and a soul and a will and an intellect. Uh, these are all immaterial parts of what it means to be a human being. And we would recognize biblically that Christ himself had a, he possessed a human spirit and a human intellect and a human will. Uh, whereas Apollinarius denies all of that and says, no, he only possessed the physical shell of a human body. So he's 100% God, but he's only, what, 50% man? And uh, biblically, we're saying, no, he's 100% God and 100% man. So the Council of Nicaea, uh, excuse me, the Council of Constantinople then, denounces Apollinarianism as being um, an inadequate view of the humanity of Christ and affirms that Christ is fully God, that's the finding of the Council of Nicaea, but also affirms that Christ is fully man, which will be articulated more clearly at the Council of Chalcedon. Jim. Did they believe that since Christ has no soul or spirit of a man, do they believe that he was possessed by the Holy Spirit himself? Um, I don't know about, uh, I don't know how they would explain the relationship between Christ's ministry here on earth and the Holy Spirit and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and those things. Um, so I don't know the answer to that question. Because I'm thinking among, among this, uh, Paul's teaching, they are the closest one who almost, they're almost persuaded that Christ is both God and man, though on the other side. Yeah, and I think the operative word here is the idea of fully, fully God and fully man. So we're not arguing for him being partially God and fully man. I mean, that's almost what Arius was arguing. He's divine, he's just not equal. So he's sort of, sort of God, but fully man. That would be Arius. And Apollinarius is saying, no, he's fully God, but he's sort of man. 
and neither view was regarded as adequate or as being an accurate reflection of biblical teaching. So the operative adjective here is fully, or if we want to put it in percentage terms, 100%. So he's 100% God and 100% man. And Arius denies the 100% God, Apollinarius denies the 100% man. But you can't deny either and be orthodox. The Spirit of Christ, if the Spirit of Christ is the Holy Spirit or the other Spirit, just like the Spirit that we have as a man. So it would be like, I'm thinking of about the Spirit of, because Christ was uh, possessed by the Spirit of God fully. So is it like, um, I'm confused now, I'm trying to. <laughs> no, because it's as a man, um, I know that he is. Is really flesh and a soul, but the question is m more on the CS. Does he possess spirit of a man like us, or he only possess the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit Himself? I don't know if you. Yeah, we, and and we can maybe talk about this more after class because I don't want the discussion to get too far into something that's not directly related to the history. But um, I think what you have to be careful of is is we have to maintain the distinction between the members of the Trinity while recognizing that the Holy Spirit did empower the Son of God during His ministry here on earth. Um, and, and yet we're, we don't want to in any way deny the full humanity of Christ. So we might need to look at specific Bible passages um, you know, for example, in 1 Peter 1.10, when it talks about the Spirit of Christ, I believe that is talking about the Holy Spirit. But I don't know that every reference in the Gospels to Christ feeling something in His Spirit, that that's a reference to the Holy Spirit, but might be a reference to His full humanity. So we might need to look passage by passage to see what the context demands. So here we're talking more theologically, wanting to maintain the distinctions that were are you know, uh, that are presented in Scripture between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and yet recognize that each member of the Trinity is fully God, and in the incarnation that the second member of the Trinity became fully man, and that's an essential component. Again, this is important because it's an essential component of the gospel. That uh, I mean, the the argument of the Book of Hebrews is based on the reality that. He who is God, the Son of God, that He became man so that we who are men might be reconciled to God. And, um, I mean, it's a, the incarnation is a core component of the gospel. So this is an important issue. And Christmas is coming up. I mean, this is what we celebrate at Christmas, right? That... He, the eternal God, the second member of the Trinity, took on flesh and became a man and dwelt among us, as it says in Philippians 2. All right. The, uh, the Council of Chalcedon in 381 essentially affirms the Council of Nicaea in 325. So you can almost think of those first two councils as a pair 325, Council of Nicaea, Arianism is denounced. 381, Arianism is again denounced, and this time it is a final and full rejection by those uh, within the Roman Empire. And in 381, we get the Niciano-Constantinopolitan Creed, which is that longer version, that expanded version of the Nicene Creed that includes more information about the Holy Spirit. And we've mentioned this before already, but that expanded version is going to lead to some controversy between the East and the West, because in the Western version of the Creed, it says the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, filioque, the uh, filioquial controversy. That and the Son phrase is not there in the Greek or Eastern version of the Creed, and so the Eastern and Western churches will argue over whether or not the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father alone or whether he proceeds from the Father and the Son. Might seem like a minor theological point, but from the Greek Orthodox perspective, they view these creeds as being 
on par with Scripture. So if you mess with a creed in their mind, it's like you're messing with uh, the text of inspired writ. Um, certainly, uh, we don't see these creeds as inspired, and uh, that was the point I was making at the beginning. But this will become an important controversy in the rift between the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church when we get to the 11th century. Okay, let's keep going. The Council of Ephesus. All right, as controversy continues to... Um, continues to rage or, or as the fight continues to be um, continues to wage within the Roman Empire, uh, you start to have politics that play a part in this, in particular the school of Alexandria and the school of Antioch come to hold very different views of how to interpret the scripture and some of their theological discussions bring these two schools of thought to a head. And you'll see that as you're reading in Olson, that there's a lot of rivalry between Antioch and Alexandria as we move into the 5th and 6th centuries of church history. Uh, early in the 5th century, people are starting to uh, think about the incarnation. Again, it's about the fact that he who is fully God became fully man. They're thinking about the incarnation, and they're thinking about the best way to express the truth of the incarnation. And questions arise about what is the best way to talk about Mary, Mary, the mother of Jesus, in light of the truth of the incarnation. And again, the, the motivation here at the Council of Ephesus in 431 is not to elevate Mary. Now, this is what's going to happen in church history as a result of this council. But the, the real issue here is we want to safeguard the truth of the incarnation. So we have some who want to say that Mary was anthropotakos or uh, anthropotikos. Sometimes it's pronounced that way. The idea that Mary is the bearer of man because when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, he was fully man. So should we refer to Mary as the, the mother of a man? Jesus was a man when he was born. So that is true insofar as it goes. But people didn't like this very much because they felt that it overemphasized the humanity of Christ. Then there were some, like Nestorius, who believed that we should refer to Mary as Christotakos the bearer of Christ. And this would be a way of emphasizing the unique relationship of his deity and his humanity in the incarnation that he was Christ. Well, that's true insofar as it goes. Mary was the mother of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. But this view ultimately gets rejected because people are afraid that it's going to confuse his two natures as if him becoming Christ, created a brand new nature. And so ultimately, the view that is decided on is theotakos or theotikos, meaning that Mary is the bearer of God. The reason this view is chosen, again, I, I can't overemphasize this, is because the church was trying to safeguard the the doctrine of Christ's deity in the incarnation, making the point that even at the moment of his birth, when he took on human flesh, he was still fully God at that moment. And so Mary then is labeled or titled or called the mother of God or the bearer of God, not because we're trying to elevate Mary, but because we're trying to safeguard the fact that in the incarnation, even at the moment of his birth, he was fully God just as he had been from all of eternity past. Now, in church history, later, this title is going to be used to elevate Mary's status to a place where it should never have been elevated to the point that now in Roman Catholic circles, she's considered by some to be the co-mediator with Christ. 
uh, co-redeemer with Christ. And the idea is that, you know, God the Father is kind of stern, so you don't necessarily want to talk to him, and Jesus is kind of busy, but Mary has time for you, and she's sympathetic and compassionate. So if you pray to Mary, she'll go talk to Jesus, and he'll work things out with the Father. All of that is completely messed up. That's the technical term for it. <laughs> but it, you know, it gains ground in church history because of the use of this label. And I remember having a conversation with a Roman Catholic coworker that I had, obviously not here, um, <laughs> who, uh, who tried to convince me that Mary is called Mother of God in the Bible. And of course, when he was pressed on it, he didn't have a verse for that because she's not called the mother of God by that title anywhere in scripture. It's a church history label in the fifth century that's applied to her out of a motivation to safeguard the incarnation. So calling Mary the mother of God is supposed to emphasize in your mind that Jesus is God even at the moment of his birth. It's not supposed to give you the idea that somehow Mary gave birth to God or that she's somehow over God in some sort of hierarchical sense. So it's just kind of interesting to see how a well-intentioned defense of the incarnation eventually leads to a really, really bad false teaching within Roman Catholic traditionalism. Can you distinguish point one and point three? Like... Well, yeah, the... the this will become a little bit more clear when we talk about Nestorius himself because Nestorius' concern was that if we emphasize only the deity of Christ by calling Mary Theotokos, if we only emphasize the deity of Christ, then the humanity of Christ is going to get lost. And he wanted to safeguard both sides of this mystery of the Incarnation. And so he wanted a term that he felt could be used to emphasize equally both sides. And so he wanted Mary to be called the mother of Christ. Because, as he said, in Christ you have both of those natures represented equally. And, and that's true. But a lot of this had to do with political rivalry between Antioch and... Alexandria. Antioch supported the Anthropotakos view. Alexandria supported the Theotakos view. And ultimately they won, even though Nestorius essentially presented a compromise view, which he felt incorporated both. So it, all of these things are true. That's, that's the kind of funny part about the Council of Ephesus. Because in the incarnation, Mary gave birth to a man. And in the Incarnation, Mary gave birth to God in human flesh. And in the Incarnation, Mary gave birth to the long-awaited Messiah, which is just the Hebrew way of translating the Greek Christ. So all three of these things are true, but they represent really political factions and rivalries that were taking place at this time within the Roman Empire. And ultimately, Theotokos triumphs do. I think largely to political currents. And you'll read about this when you get to the Council of Ephesus and then a little bit later with Cyril of Alexandria and his successor, Dioscorus, and the robber synod. Have you guys read about that yet? It's probably still coming up in Olson's reading. But things got kind of nasty between some of these different theological parties within the Roman Empire. Um, so all three of these things are true. But in terms of what comes to be seen as historically orthodox, an emphasis on Christ's deity triumphs. And I think we can largely affirm that even though we recognize truth in all of these titles. Does the Eastern Orthodox Church today elevate Mary like the Roman Catholic Church does? Or when they say Mary the Mother of God, are they holding to the original... Uh, I, I don't know if they elevate her quite to the same extent, but that my understanding of Eastern Orthodoxy today is, is much more limited than my understanding of Roman Catholicism. So we will talk a little bit later in this class, not today, but a later lecture about Eastern Orthodoxy and about some of their distinctives. They emphasize mystery, they emphasize the sacraments, they emphasize tradition, 
Um, but I don't know that they, I know that they pray to saints and that they include icons of saints and others, but I don't know if they elevate Mary to the same level as some do in Roman Catholicism. Yeah, in my time in Greece, um, I didn't see any weird images of Mary the, the way you would expect in a Roman mm-hmm. Catholic kind of setting. And, and in talking to some of the uh, local believers out there, um, they, they, the first thing they will say when differentiating themselves between themselves and the Roman Catholic Church is their, their belief in Mary. So, so they would use that as one of the one of the um, strong points for what separates the two. Yeah, it's interesting. Yep. Going back to uh, Nestorius, uh, mm-hmm. it said there that he was accused of um, teaching that Christ was two separate persons. Did he really teach that? Well, we're going to get into that because he gets condemned a little bit later at the Council of... Um, well, he gets condemned at Ephesus and then uh, again at Chalcedon. Most historians, most historians do not believe that Nestorius was guilty of what he was accused of teaching. So there will be a view called Nestorianism, and most historians don't think Nestorius was a Nestorian. Um, or that the Nestorian church, as it comes to be called, actually taught what Nestorius was accused of teaching. So we'll discuss that a little bit more. Yep. How much weight do you put on the results from this council as being uh, the starting point for, uh, for, for it going in the direction of, of them worshiping there? And that even today, do they still bring up the Council of Ephesus to uh, verify their worship of Mary? Yeah, how much weight do we put on the Council of Ephesus for what leads to the, I think, idolatrous uh, elevation of Mary? Uh, I think it's pretty significant. I mean, we we start to have the elevation of Mary and of the saints after the integration of Roman paganism into Christianity. And uh, like we talked about in an earlier class period, you have essentially the Christians... um, treating biblical saints and historical heroes in the same way that the Greeks treated their pagan deities. And so now we're going to start, you know, lighting candles and praying and and doing all sorts of things to pay homage to the saints. Well, that's not something that's part of biblical Christianity. It's not something that's part of the persecuted church's experience in the first few centuries of the church. It's after paganism is Christianized that suddenly all of these practices come in. So the elevation of Mary is part of that, and then you start to have things like this, and it just it cements it as if it is um, a justifiable way to approach Mary. Because now Mary's the mother of God. Uh, which... Again, if you understand it in the sense of defending the Incarnation, it makes sense. But even then, I'm not sure it's the best way to affirm the Incarnation. Now granted, we have the advantage of looking back over 1600 years of all the bad things that that led to. But I think it's pretty significant. All right, as the uh, Incarnation is continuing to be... um, As the Incarnation is continuing to be discussed and debated, there will be now a couple more views here about the nature of Christ. We're going to have what we've already just briefly mentioned, Nestorianism. Now, Nestorianism says Jesus is fully God and Jesus is fully man. And this is going to lead to two persons. That's what Nestorianism. So we have two natures. Nature, deity, nature, humanity. And Nestorius is accused of putting such a sharp wedge between Christ's humanity and his deity that essentially he's turned Jesus into a schizophrenic. So Jesus now is fully God and he's fully man, but he possesses two personalities. He's two different people. 
And uh, that was what Nestorius was accused of teaching. Now again, most historians don't think Nestorius actually went that far, but he was accused of teaching that Christ had two personalities, two different persons, that he was essentially a, for lack of a better word, a schizophrenic who was kind of going back and forth between being fully God and fully man. So it affirms the two natures, but says that the two natures produce two different people. That's Nestorianism. Then you have a guy named Eutychus, who comes along, not the guy who fell out the window when Paul was preaching in the book of Acts, but a different guy. Eutychus. Eutychus. And Nestorius is from Antioch. Eutychus is from Alexandria. So Eutychus takes the opposite view. And he says, yes, Jesus is fully God. And yes, Jesus is fully man. But that these two things are mixed together to create a hybrid. Well, the problem is, once you have a hybrid, then he's not really fully God anymore, and he's not really fully man anymore because he's become something new. So if we were to use an illustration of this, Nestorianism is like putting water and oil into the same container. If you put water and oil into a container, it's one container, but the water and the oil are never going to mix. That's Nestorianism. These two natures end up in the one Jesus Christ, and yet they never mix, so it's as if he has dual personalities. He's bipolar. Sorry for using all these modern psychological terms, but they become useful in illustrating what the problem was with Nestorianism. For Eutychus, we have a different problem. It's like mixing water with, uh, you know, jello that you buy in a packet, right? Well, in the packet, the jello is like the sugary, grainy substance, and we all know what water is. But when you mix them together and stir it up and let it sit in the refrigerator, it produces an entirely different substance. It's a complete hybrid, and we call it jello, and my kids love it. But the jello is no longer a grainy substance anymore, and it's no longer water anymore. It's something completely new. Well, that's Eutychianism, or it will become known as monophy, uh, <coughs> the monophysite or monophysite. You can say it either way. The monophysite view. Uh, the physite there has the idea of one nature. So monophysite, monophysite means one nature. So Eutychus taught that there is... <laughs> I'll put this up here. Nestorianism teaches that there are two natures which equals two persons. Eutychus teaches that there is one nature which is a hybrid of humanity and deity. All right? So Nestorius, he affirms fully God and fully man, but he's created a bipolar product. Eutychus, he has so mixed the two together that in the end he's created a hybrid which is no longer distinctly or fully God and fully man. So these are the two extremes. The Council of Chalcedon convened to clarify the biblical teaching regarding the dual nature of Christ. And essentially, here's where it ended up with a middle position which was offered by Leo, Leo the Great. And we'll talk more about Leo a little bit later, but Leo the First of Rome and this, by the way, is one of the very important stepping stones in the development of Roman Catholic theology because the Monophysite party was the Alexandrian view. The Nestorian party was essentially the Antiochian view. And Rome comes along and says, hey, Antioch, 
Alexandria, both of you very important cities within the Roman Empire. You guys are fighting over this. Let me play umpire, essentially is what Leo says. And here we have the Bishop of Rome starting to assert ecclesiastical authority over other prominent churches within the Roman Empire. So this will become an important stepping stone towards the development of the Roman papacy. But Leo said this, we need to, we need to recognize the full nature of his deity and the full nature of his humanity, that he is 100% God and 100% man. We need to affirm those two distinct natures. So the Monophysite Eutychian view cannot be right because it confuses the natures. And we need to affirm both natures in their full sense. But, at the same time, it's not biblically accurate or helpful to so distinguish between the two natures that you end up creating a version of Jesus Christ where he is somehow schizophrenic or bipolar or has split personality disorder. That's not helpful. So Nestorianism creates this wall of separation that goes beyond how the Bible presents this truth. So we need to affirm both natures in their fullness, and yet we don't see two different personalities in Jesus Christ. So the Chalcedonian solution is to affirm the fact that Jesus Christ is two natures, in one person. Nestorianism, two natures in two persons. Eutychianism, one nature, one person. Chalcedon, two natures, one person. Now, I realize that was probably a little bit confusing, but what we are, again, defending here is the reality of the incarnation. Jesus Christ is 100% God and 100% man. Two natures. And yet those two natures coexist in him in perfect unity such that he is only one person. Two natures, one person. In theology, we call that the hypostatic union. And it comes from the, the articulation of it comes from the Council of Chalcedon in 451. So here's what ultimately the Council of Chalcedon expressed with regard to the two natures of Christ. The two natures of Christ coexist in his singular person, and they coexist without confusion, that would be Eutychianism, without change, without division, that would be Nestorianism, or separation. And uh, sometimes historians talk about how Chalcedon essentially set the boundaries of orthodoxy and said, look, this is a mystery. We can't fully understand it. It is a biblical miracle. It's a mystery. And yet what we can affirm from Scripture is that Christ had two natures and those two natures coexist in the one person without confusion or change. That's the one side. That guards against Eutychianism. And without division or separation, that guards against Nestorianism. And as long as you stay within those boundaries, then you are within an orthodox view of who Christ is. Yep, Josh. When you say change, are you, are you meaning like the, the hybrid, the two become a different thing, so it, it changes the nature? Correct. Okay. So without confusion or without creating a third nature that would be a hybrid of the two. So I have here a, then a little bit of the Chalcedonian Creed. Uh, Leo had written in his tome uh, much of this, and this is what was embraced. I thought I had the Chalcedonian Creed here. Maybe I don't. Uh, I must have it later under Leo. I know I have it in the notes somewhere. Oh, that's okay. Uh, <clears throat> but the Chalcedonian Creed 
emerges in church history as the most important of the ancient creeds outside of the Nicene Creed. And of course, I'm talking about the expanded niceno constantinopolitan Creed, but the Nicene Creed is the most important of the historic creeds. The Chalcedonian Creed is the second most important. The Nicene Creed affirms the distinct personhood and full deity of Jesus Christ and also the Holy Spirit. So the Nicene Creed affirms the Trinity. The Chalcedonian Creed affirms that Jesus Christ is simultaneously 100% God and 100% man, and yet he is only one person. And so what we call the hypostatic union is the doctrine that is articulated by the Chalcedonian Creed. Now, up to this point, evangelicals are saying, yeah, I can defend all of this from Scripture. I can defend the fact that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man and that he is only one person. That is biblically defensible. I can defend the fact that he is fully God and fully man. I can defend the fact that the Holy Spirit is fully God and yet a distinct member of the Trinity. I can defend the Trinity and I can defend the hypostatic union from Scripture. And that really, again, is why these have value for us. They also help us, I think, especially with regard to the nature of Christ here at the Council of Chalcedon, they help us remember the fact that at some point we have to submit to the teaching of Scripture rather than allowing logical speculation to get us into trouble. And it happened with Arius, it happened with Apollinarius, it happened with Nestorianism, I'm using the noun form there because we're not sure if Nestorius really believed it. It happened with uh, Eutychianism. These guys allowed their speculation to get ahead of them and Chalcedon says, hey, wait a second, when it comes to understanding the relationship of the two natures of Jesus Christ, that he is both fully God and fully man, there is an element of mystery in that. It, the mystery of the incarnation that goes beyond full the ability of humans to have full understanding. So embrace the mystery. It's okay. Don't allow a desire to unravel every mystery in the Bible to lead you into theological error. And so Chalcedon says, look, embrace the mystery and recognize that these things coexist without separation or change, without separation or uh, division on the one hand, and without confusion or change on the other hand, and as long as you affirm the mystery and affirm the dual biblical truths of Christ's full humanity and his full de deity, then you will be safely within orthodox waters. If we're thinking of a channel. So, I think this is, you know, I think all of these controversies and councils, they are very helpful Again, insofar as they defend what the Scripture teaches and don't go beyond what the Scripture teaches. And up to this point, with the exception of Theotokos and the devastating effects that it has later in history, I think we're pretty safe. All right, the, uh, the next two councils, the Second Council of Constantinople and the Third Council of Constantinople, are essentially reiterations of the Council of Chalcedon. So we have the Council of Nicaea, and then the Council of Constantinople is a reiteration of Nicaea. Then we have the Council of Ephesus and Chalcedon, and then the Second and Third Councils of Constantinople are reiterations of Chalcedon. So a lot of these councils get reiterated at later councils. Chalcedon settled the issue of the hypostatic union in the West. But in the East... There were a lot of people of the Monophysite persuasion who continued to fight against what becomes known as the Diophysite view. The Diophysites teach two natures. The Monophysites teach one nature. The one nature view confuses and does not maintain a distinction between the fact that he's 100% God and 100% man. That's the problem. And so this issue continues to rage for another 200 years in the East. And you have at the Second Council of Constantinople, the Monophysites and the Diophysites, and the Diophysites are victorious 
and the Monophysites are condemned, which means that the Council of Chalcedon is upheld in the east. Now there's a lot more about that. Some important individuals who were involved. Justinian was the emperor. Leontius of Byzantium was the primary theologian. There was a controversy called the Three Chapters Controversy where previous works by Theodore of Mopsuestia and Theodore of Cyrus and another guy named uh, Ibas of Edessa were condemned. Um, and we could get on all the specifics of that. But I think for, for you, in terms of a survey, the important thing is Chalcedon was under attack in the east and it was reaffirmed as being true at the Second Council of Constantinople. The Third Council of Constantinople takes the issue even farther. And now we're starting to get, I think, into the realm of speculation. I mean, maybe you guys feel like we were, we're already there, but we're definitely getting into the realm of white space theology, and we're arguing about things that have more to do with Greek metaphysics than really with biblical revelation. But there comes an issue at the Third Council of Constantinople as to whether or not Jesus Christ had one will or two wills. So if, if Jesus is two natures, 100% God and 100% man, does that mean that he also has two wills, a human will and a divine will? Or if Jesus is one person, two natures in one person, does that mean that he only has one will that goes along with that one personality? All right, so we're, we're getting pretty deep into the metaphysics of trying to figure this all out. The monotheletes taught that Jesus only has one will. The diotheletes taught that Jesus has two wills. Ultimately, the diotheolite or diotheolite view is victorious. And so then in Roman Catholic and Greek Orthodox ways of thinking about the two natures of Christ, we would say he has two natures and those two natures have produced two wills, a human will and a divine will, and yet those two wills always operate in perfect harmony and unity with one another because they make up one person, the one person, Jesus Christ. But at this point, I feel like we're starting to get into a realm of probably better to just embrace the mystery and not try and figure out all the specifics. Yeah, Rich. Refer to Orthodox and Catholic here. We're getting away from the traditional words, and now we're referring to Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic. Yeah, when I made that statement, I was. And as we move into the Middle Ages, we definitely start to see a shift in the terminology. When we start to refer to Orthodox, we're going to be capitalizing the O. And when we refer to Catholic, we're going to be capitalizing the C because we're going to be referring more to Greek or Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic rather than using those terms in their real historic sense of meaning straight or meaning universal. And the reason why I asked that that's what the notes show, that it's capitalized both. Yes. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't know that this particular council has major implications for uh, the study of systematic theology today. It's just interesting to see that they're getting so specific in their attempt to understand. Chalcedon essentially says the incarnation is a mystery. Embrace the mystery. Believe what the scripture teaches and don't go beyond what the scripture teaches into vain speculations. And then they spend the next 200 years going into speculations and arguing about those things. So... Um, it's just kind of interesting to see how it all works out. Yeah, Matthew. That's kind of uh, what my question was, where it's like, because um, in a reading, like, it'll, I, I will find myself, like, agreeing to a certain extent, and then it'll be, hold on, when you just said that, well, I wouldn't agree with that. What point is it to where it's just, it becomes a study, but it doesn't become something that you move forward in as far as in your 
teaching and your preaching because most people, if, we, if you try to bring something like this to them, it's, it's going to be like, <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah, look, if we're going to boil this all down, and I know we've been going through a whole bunch of different views and who denied what and who said what and why did they say that and how is that different than that guy, and I, I, I understand that it gets a little bit confusing. If we take a step back and get back to where we started at, the issue, and it is an important issue, the issue was the person and work of Jesus Christ. And you have to get that right. Absolutely, you have to get that right. And when we look at what does the Bible teach about the person of Christ, Scripture teaches that Christ is fully God. Absolutely. And Scripture teaches that He, in His incarnation, became fully man. Absolutely. So, if you affirm those two biblical truths, then all of this is just kind of historical window dressing. And I get that, but the history is there because it shows us how men in the past tried to wrestle through some of these issues. And the church did struggle with the idea that, wait a minute, 100% plus 100%, doesn't that equal 200%? And the answer is no. That's the mystery of the hypostatic union, because he is only one person. And that's also biblically defensible. So 100% God, 100% man, one person. Two natures, one person. Nestorius, two natures, two persons, that's not going to work. Eutychus, one nature, one person, that's not going to work either. Because those things are not biblically defensible. Two natures, one person, that is biblically defensible. And so... In light of that, we affirm the Chalcedonian Creed. Just like with the Nicene Creed, uh, Father, Son, and Spirit are all described or each described in Scripture as being fully God and each described as being distinct persons. Therefore, one God, three persons. The doctrine of the Trinity. How does that work? How can you have one God who's three persons? Is, doesn't that make you a tritheist? No, it doesn't. Well, why not? Because it's a mystery that is presented in Scripture, and I must believe both claims. Because they're both presented in Scripture as being true. And the same thing with the hypostatic union. And where Chalcedon comes along and is helpful, is it essentially says, as long as you believe what the Bible teaches, you can leave it at that and affirm the mystery, and, and just don't go outside the boundaries of orthodoxy, and just, you'll be fine. And I think that's ultimately where we have to leave it, is we say we want to understand as much as God has seen fit to reveal to us, but where he has not seen fit to reveal the details to us, we leave the details to God and we, we live our lives based on what we know to be true. You know, Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord. Um, so yeah, that's where I end up in the midst of this whole discussion. And I'm sorry if there were parts of it that were confusing, uh, probably an indication of the uh, clarity with which the material was presented. But um, I think ultimately where this leads us is again to affirm what we said at the beginning. We believe what we believe not because of a council or a creed. We believe what we believe because it is taught in the scriptures. And where the councils articulate biblical truth, they are helpful. So Nicaea is helpful and Chalcedon is helpful. But insofar as they stray from biblical truth or go beyond biblical revelation, then they become much less helpful. And the, the Third Council of Constantinople, in my thinking, starts to get us into the speculation and the white spaces of Scripture where it doesn't become as helpful. The Second Council of Nicaea, since I have two minutes left, in 787 goes completely off track. So if evangelicals are riding on the train through the first six councils, we've jumped before we get to the seventh council because the train's about to crash. The seventh council, the second council of Nicaea, was a council in which icons were established as being legitimate expressions of worship in the church. What's an icon? An icon is a picture, a statue, a figurine, uh, anything that, any physical representation of Jesus, Mary, biblical saints, or historical heroes. 
The reason when you walk into a Catholic or Greek Orthodox church today, it looks like a cheesy Christian bookstore where they've got lots of figurines and all sorts of statues and pictures and candles and all of this nonsense is because of the Second Council of Nicaea, which said it was okay. We'll talk about all of that in a later lecture, but that council is one where evangelicals say, no way, there is no way we are going to be on board with what happened there. The evangelical principle, sola scriptura, is in place there because scripture always trumps history.